I think being autistic and having sensory sensitivities impacts all of my life. So obviously it's gonna impact my sex and sexuality experience. Things like, for example, I'm really sensitive to smell and people have quite strong smells that you might not notice until you're kind of up close. And so that's something I've had to learn to manage. Hannah, as a clinician, can you explain more how sensory sensitivities might impact this experience? Neurodivergent people want to have sex and they want to be close to people but it's very sensory overload sometimes i suggest a shower beforehand i think that's quite good together maybe so that everything's clean and find a smell that you do like so one smell because multiple smells are difficult shower afterwards and just be able to talk about it I think that can be really difficult, can't it? Opening those conversations can yeah. be feel really awkward yeah. and really embarrassing. But I would say that for me, what I've realised that is that if I'm not in the position to have those conversations, then it's probably not right for me to be being intimate with this person anyway. Like, the level of intimacy that we're about to share is more than talking about my sensory sensitivities. Molly, do you feel like your sensory needs have ever impacted your experiences in this area? Because I was never taught as a young you know, adult to be very confident and speak up and advocate for myself and be comfortable being vulnerable with people that I may not feel 100% comfortable around. I put myself in positions where I shouldn't have been in those situations where I should have maybe have spoken up and said, I'm not comfortable. I never, I never did because I was so scared of being rejected and being told, you know, you need to do it. Now, if I could go back and tell the younger Molly, it would be very much like, stop. Think about, do you actually want to do this or not? Because my sensory issues were very prominent then and they still are now, but then because I didn't know what was going on, I didn't have a diagnosis at that point, I thought I was like weird. So I, I put myself in these positions because I was like proving myself wrong. No, you're not weird. You can do this. But I put that much pressure on myself that I made myself do it. And thinking back to my first time and stuff like that, I shouldn't have done it because I wasn't very comfortable. Like for me personally, I have sensory issues around touch. Like I really can't handle light touch, which is something that people often use in intimate situations. Yeah. And I also find sensory issues around like the noise. Like if there's a loud noise, say, and I'm in a situation with someone where we're being intimate, I can completely not be in my body anymore because I'm over there in the garden listening to someone cutting the lawn. So I feel like there's so much around my sensory sensitivities that can distract me and mean that I'm not present, that yeah. I have to really consider those things in order to be having, as you say, an experience that is positive for you, rather than ticking the box of, I have done this job of being intimate with this person that I feel like I'm supposed to be doing. Would you mind talking about like specific sensory sensitivities that you have? Yeah, so for me, like hot and sweaty, I don't like that. I don't like the feeling of having somebody else, you know, with you, feeling like that, rubbing up against, I, no, it's not my vibe. I, I didn't like it and never have done. But I pushed myself to do it because, you know, like you say, done it. Mm. But that was, and it still is, very much an issue that I, I don't like. And like you say, smell is a very big thing. I'm very easily triggered by smells and it, I get migraines. And the, what I smell, other people seem to not be able to smell. And it's like, but I can smell that. Can, can you not smell? But it, it, like you say, it distracts me and makes me feel like I can't do this here. But um, like aftershaves, like aftershave is like a big one where I'm like, like, I can't, you know, literally, I can't think of anything else but that smell. And that is, again, distracting. Um, but yeah, and like, for me, it's more the, the heat and the body and touching and yeah it's, yeah. it's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. I feel like for me, anything that takes me away from being fully immersed in the experience means that, and I think this probably is an autistic thing, I then become so aware of the ridiculousness of the situation that I am in because there is no logic to intimacy with it's another no. human being unless I guess you are looking to procreate right otherwise yeah. it is completely illogical what are we doing here why are we doing this what is you know what is this and so anything that means I'm suddenly like in the room going what the heck isn't going to enhance my experience <laughs> does that make sense no it does perfect yeah it makes sense to me so obviously managing the sensory environment as you've said Hannah is really important and that's things like considering lighting and sound and smell 
But we're with another person here, so let's talk a little bit about how you think it is best to communicate, to learn to communicate these needs with your partner. It's really difficult because I think anyone should have a frank conversation with their partner before they have sex, but yeah. that's not how the world works, is it? Because we tend to get into it before it happens. Being very open about your sensory needs, knowing what they are for yourself. So things like lighting, things like smell, things like sound, and just saying this is the way that we're going to have the best um, mm. time together and writing it down maybe or having it written down for yourself and then sharing it with your partner before you go into it. I think that's the only thing you can do. But it's it is hard. It's really tough. I think if someone doesn't respect you, again, we go back to if someone doesn't respect you enough to listen to what your sensory needs are, then they don't respect you enough for you to be wanting to have sex with them. I think another issue is we have quite a lot of media representation of sex between neurotypical people. Mm. And so I think sometimes people learn how to communicate around sex from those examples. But the only example I've ever seen of sex with autistic people is on The Good Doctor. And obviously the mm. guy playing The Good Doctor is not autistic, so it is not entirely authentic. So I wonder whether it would be useful if we actually had some more examples out there in the world that we could look at and use as part of learning how to communicate this stuff. I think it's also important to say that the neurotypical things we see on TV about having sex aren't also how it happens for neurotypical people. <laughs> like, it does give you this, like, benchmark, and you're like, why is this not happening? So I think also these conversations are really important because it makes us realise that it is just really weird. Because there's no right or wrong, <laughs> is there? There's no, like, right or wrong way to have sex. I suppose it's what you're comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody is talking about this stuff and we're not being educated about this stuff. <laughs> and we're certainly not being educated about how to talk about the fact that I feel like your breath smells like a dog right now. But I don't know how to say that to you because it feels rude and this does not feel like the moment. Okay, so let's just get down to icks, sensory icks around sex. For me personally, I don't like it when someone is kissing me and getting their saliva on my body. Mm -hmm. I find that really disgusting and again something that's really hard to communicate because it's not normally the sort of thing you've talked about beforehand so I think it's really important to know that you can say no no as a full sentence as a full sentence when a sensory it happens so just because you haven't laid out a full list of ways in which they might impact your sensory sensitivities does not mean that you cannot stop midway and say oh actually I hadn't even thought of this but that's a no for me yeah like withdraw your consent right at any time so have you got any Sensory icks. To be fair, my biggest one, it always has been a bit like, just something going inside me has always been a bit like, ooh, because I've never really liked the idea. I've always thought like, it's not, nothing's meant to go inside me unless I'm having, a, unless I want a baby. You know, very much like black and white thinking, I don't, why do I need to do this if I don't want a baby? Right. So like so having, like, you know, you know, intercourse says, you know, it goes inside you. And for me, it was very much like, no, no. The first time was very much like, I don't like this. It wasn't like comfortable because mm. it was like, it doesn't feel right to me. Oh, I, and again, like I said, I should have advocated and said maybe, nope, stop, I'm not comfortable. But because the tick in the box thing, I, I just done it because it was like, I need mm. to do it. Um, but yeah, no, those sort of things and like bodily fluids, the, 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 the thing of like diseases, getting transmitted disease, things like that is just a bit, for me, I, I'm not terribly like okay with things like that I'm very like conscious about like, I would make someone sign a, a, a like a waiver you're sure you haven't got nothing because to me it's very much that's an issue mm. like the whole idea of catching anything is like no I want everything clean tidy but you know like you say it doesn't always happen like that things don't can't plan things can you it's sometimes spontaneous and yeah yeah I guess you can ask someone to wear a condom yeah no yeah, that's yeah yeah I was going to say that but because talk yeah. If you don't have someone wear a condom, it's not just the sensory ick at that time. That can continue mm -hmm. due to gravity throughout the day, right? Yeah. There can be yeah. fluids that hang around for quite a long time if you don't use a condom that can be a real sensory issue for some people, right? Just thinking about it, isn't it? Just like knowing that, yeah, that's, yeah, that's my icks. Because you're not taught about all these little things at school, so 
in the real world things happen which you don't generally you're not you're not taught until you're in that moment so like yeah those icks are very much they're very dominant at the time but like you say they can prolong um depending on if you use condoms or not but yeah yeah another one for me is eye contact during intimacy so like when someone is inside you or being intimate and they're looking at you in that this is so romantic aren't we having a moment kind of way into your eyes I find that deeply uncomfortable and I feel like I can't look away because that's rude and you're gonna feel unconnected from me but I feel like I don't know. It just feels wrong. I guess actually as an autistic person, I don't like eye contact. Yeah. This makes me think what we're talking about here is that we have this whole set of social rules around sex and intimacy that can be very similar to the social rules around life that neurotypical people seem to find easy that I as an autistic person feel like I have to conform to or mask to because otherwise I'm getting it wrong, but actually would maybe rather change those rules to suit my neurology, Mm. right? Yeah. But it's about communication, isn't it? And I think it's something that we don't do very well in the neurotypical world anyway. I think sex is such a difficult area for a lot of people because you have to communicate what you like, what you don't like. And I think quite often, and I'm not trying to be sexist, but a lot of girls and women and non-binary individuals agree to things before yeah I've been in those situations I think like behaviour is a form of communication and like if someone isn't willing to sit down and listen to what I want or like what I need then to me that's showing me that their behaviour isn't acceptable and maybe I shouldn't be in this situation do you do that now? I have I've had to advocate I've I've been put through situations not just in sex but in relationships and friendships where I haven't and it's led me to go down paths that I didn't want to be Mm. down but as I've gotten older and like obviously life experiences, it gave me that confidence to be like, this is what I need. And you know, if we're gonna go go through with this, then that's that's what I need. If it doesn't work for you, then maybe that's it's not meant to be. Then it's not. I'm not gonna be comfortable. And I'm I'm you know no is what I'm saying. I'm not gonna consent to be in that situation. Yeah. I kind of want to give you a little round of applause. That's great. So that so that's really interesting because the point what Molly said is about being diagnosed and I think that's the thing is that if you know yourself and have yeah. insight into your own differences and that's it, things yeah. then probably gives you confidence it definitely did but beforehand um you know I like I said I thought I was a bit weird and I thought I'm just going to do these things to prove myself wrong like I can do this so I pushed myself to do many things that I didn't want to do but as soon as I was diagnosed something just switched and I thought, no, I don't need to prove my, like, to myself that I can do these things because there is no timeline in life. And as soon as that hit, I was like, I stopped doing everything that didn't make me happy. And now I've the hap- I'm the happiest I've ever been because I don't do those things. I don't put myself in situations that I don't want to be in. No is, like I say, is a full sentence. And I've learned that. But before it was, if that makes you happy, then I'll do it. But it, it shouldn't be like that. It should be, I'm not happy. I'm not doing it. But I've had to learn, like, that is not easy. Like, therapy, talking Mm. to people, that's the only way I've learned how to advocate. Um, And I feel like that's why being here today is is important because not everyone has access to a diagnosis or to therapy. So I feel like this conversation is really important to have. So we've talked about communicating need, but the other really important thing to communicate is boundaries and consent and making sure that at any stage in an intimate situation you feel safe and protected and able to withdraw consent. I know that consent is something that you have been doing a lot of research and thinking into Hannah so can I hand this over to you to talk about? I work with a lot of women and girls and non-binary people that have been assaulted particularly when I started to work in the prison system in women's prisons they were in prison for what we would call prostitution but it's actually that they were involved with someone that they thought they could trust who got them to do things that they didn't want to do this is part of the journey where I realise that things, there's something going on here. Because I think the thing is, is that there is such, there's such a desire 
and want to be wanted and loved and accepted among neurodivergent people. But then particularly if you're not diagnosed and you're not equipped and you're not understanding and you don't have people supporting you in the right way and then maybe drugs become involved and lots of other stuff it's really easy to end up in the wrong situation and not know how to get out and it is frightening how easy it is to be in a situation and then realize that you're in a bad situation but you're already in it not to say they obviously didn't do things that were not right, but we all do things that are not right. Sometimes. They didn't do it with intent. Mm -mm. Huh. Yeah. Because they trusted somebody. Um, and I think that's the, the problem with consent, is agreeing to do something because you think it's going to get you some love and acceptance like you might agree to something and then be in that situation and it doesn't feel right but you feel like you've said yes that's not the case you can say you'll do something start to do something realize that it's not right and still withdraw consent i think that's where people i think that's where like a lot of teaching needs to happen because not a lot of people know that and they th they feel like once they've said yes they've got to go through it out of humiliation as well. I feel like yeah. you might be ashamed to say, actually, no, no, I'm not, I don't want to do it. Once you've started going and you feel like, actually, no, I don't want to do that. I don't think we're taught that generally, though. I don't think no. neurotypical people are taught that either. I think where it becomes dangerous is when you've got this thing that none of us are taught and maybe none of us are comfortable with intersecting with someone who carries trauma, who maybe has low self-esteem and who's maybe developed some strong people-pleasing tendencies. And I know that for me, I've been in situations that haven't been right for me that I have blamed myself for because my tendency at that time as a highly masking, undiagnosed autistic person was to look for me as the problem in all situations. I've even been in situations which are arguably, you know, could be considered kind of sexual violence where I have felt afterwards, well, that was on me. Mm. And I think that's a common experience for, particularly for autistic people, because we've been told our whole lives, and particularly for ADHDers, because we've been told our whole lives that we're the problem. So why, why wouldn't we automatically assume that we're the problem? Yeah, because we always feel like we're not doing like as good as we could be. So like you're not trying hard enough. So you feel like you have to do something to please other people. Otherwise, that rejection and that that like you like being um, like told you're not good enough is gonna and that feeling is not great to have. Like to feel like you're the problem and you have flaws. I mean, looking for it in yourself and I mean that's heartbreaking. Or like I felt like. Honestly, I felt like because I'm intense, because I have emotional dysregulation, so I might have cried or I might have shouted or I might have behaved in ways that I'm not proud of, that means that their response to that was obviously right because, because of the way that I was, that's obviously on me, right? At the end of the day, no matter what, no one has a right to cross your boundaries in a way that isn't acceptable. But I think that that is a message we need to be getting out there. And that's what I mean, like, yeah, everybody isn't good at consent, everyone isn't being taught about consent, but autistic people are particularly vulnerable when not being taught about consent. Especially undiagnosed neurodivergent mm -hmm. young people, it really worries me because you're doing everything, they are doing everything to try and fit in and be included and wanted and mm -hmm. liked. And so you're sort of taught that if you have sex with someone, then it's gonna be okay and you'll be in. It's really dangerous. Mm. I think the one thing that can affect knowing what your boundaries should be and what, what you can and can't consent to is where you're getting your information about what sex looks like, right? And mm -hmm. I think, especially now with the internet, young people are getting their idea of what sex looks like from pornography which is a completely poor representation, often designed for the male gaze. And that's dangerous on two counts for me. It's dangerous in terms of people feeling that they should perform in a certain way, but it's also dangerous in terms of expectations that particularly maybe male partners might have on what they should be getting in that experience. It's not realistic. Like, you know, I see a lot of the representation is very thin white women lovely blonde hair very like petite 
I'm really not 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 every woman is like that from a, a boy's point of view. They they see this and they think that is a beautiful woman and that's what they want and that's what they expect. In my like opinion, that's not what makes somebody beautiful. And I feel like they grow up seeing this from like I think it's getting younger and younger, and they're, they're believing it from such a young age that it's it's built in that they think it's normal. But when it comes to it, when it's reality, they, they're like disappointed because it's it doesn't work like that. It's not it's not like that. That's not what reality is. You know, we're not all photoshopped in in real life. When that's not how it works. They're always making particular noises, and they're always yeah. very focused on pleasing him. And it's it is very much for the male gaze, isn't it? I think that's also got a lot to answer for for the rise in sexual violence as well. Um, there has been an increase in young adolescent men assaulting girls and it's because they think that the way that they see the sex is the way that you're meant to do it and it's quite violent and painful. I think that's like, as well, like when you're autistic and you mask and you see these things, you think that's how it's meant to be. So for males, you know, autistic males, they might think that is how I've got to do it. And they portray it, but they may not mean, mean to bec- like come across like that. But you know they do it because that's what they see, mm. and that's how they think that they that this they should act. And I, again, that's just another like vulnerable place that that puts autistic people in. Yeah, I agree. So, I think there are some like obvious red flags that we could talk about now that it might be helpful to have in this video. For example, one red flag that I've learned about is a thing called love bombing, right? Which is where someone is like super, 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 super nice to you and acts as if you're the best thing ever and then is suddenly really horrible and mean and nasty. And then when you're upset about that, they go back to being super, super nice to you and the pattern repeats. And that's one that I've learned about that I think is quite a useful one to share. Have you guys guys got any other red flags that you'd say people should be looking for? I'd say the unwillingness to communicate, like sit down and speak about something, as in like what you like, what they like. They're not willing to meet you in the middle and like compromise them. For me, that's like a big no. Then I feel like that isn't a situation or, you know, a partnership that you should put yourself in personally. I Yeah, I agree. And also I think um, someone that starts to tell you that your friends aren't very nice and um, isolates you from people around you so that they make you sort of believe that they're the only person you can see. That's quite a vulnerable point, I think, for neurodivergent young people. I've seen that happen a lot, actually, in, like, young people where Mm. they're, like, they cut off their friends Mm. and become this, like, absorbed with this one person. But really, like, and then, like, their friends become that person's friends and then they don't do anything apart. Mm. I feel feel like doing everything together isn't a healthy situation. Obviously, if that's how, how great, if it works for you, but... I feel like time apart and getting to know yourself is is great. And if your partner isn't encouraging that, that's a massive red flag. But I would also add to that that if you have a friend and you're noticing their partner doing that, rather than thinking, oh, they are rejecting me because they're just going off with their partner, think, is is my friend actually okay? Yeah. What is happening here? Yeah, I've, I've actually been in a situation where it's like that and my friend has gone off with a partner and I feel like oh I'm not I'm not you don't want to be my friend anymore but later on you know as the relationship developed it was actually this person was an extreme narcissist and a really dominant person and the relationship became quite you know violent and it wasn't nice but it does happen and I I felt like this person rejected me because they didn't want, you know, they'd got a boyfriend out, that's it. And I don't think you should necessarily do anything that puts you in danger. No. But just stay. Don't don't go. That's it. Be there, be at the end of the phone if they need you. Yeah, right? staying present is a good mm. thing. And making sure they know that you're there. Because that's what I would do. Be like, I'm here, you know. I know we might not be as close, but I'm here. Yeah. And then there's obvious things like, obviously, if someone is physically violent towards you, that is never okay. But there's also verbal violence, right? If someone's saying negative things about you or your family or your friends, Mm. that's just never okay, really, is it? No. I think autistic people might be particularly vulnerable to manipulations like coercive control. Because, for example, there's a number of reasons that I'm I personally feel like I might get sucked into that. One is that notion that we're sold in media that we will find our person and they will be everything. You know, if you've ever watched a rom-com, that's going to happen. But also the idea that, like, this is what I need to do in order for someone to love me. So I wonder whether you feel like that's the case in the women that you've worked with, Hannah. 
Completely. I think manipulation is a massive part of it. So I work with young people that have been victims of childhood sexual exploitation, CSE. So that has purely happened on the basis that people know that these neurodivergent individuals will want to be in a gang or in a relationship or loved or liked and they will use that and that's manipulation and that's something that happens without you realizing because they'll tell you things that you want to hear about yourself they'll tell you that you know with girls and women and non-binary people it will be that they're beautiful they're sexy that they want to be with them and then gradually they'll start to get them to do things for them like if you go and do this thing i'll take you out for dinner it's really subtle and I think there's something in there about also being generally quite trusting. Like I have a really hard time with the idea that people don't always have good intentions. Mm. I know that that's the case and I know that there are people out there like that, but I genuinely don't tend to be suspicious about that in any situation. And I'm generally quite shocked when someone does something that's deliberately bad. Like the idea that someone could think, I'm going to do this bad thing and do it is really, really alien to me. That's the thing, it's alien. It's like, why would anyone do this to me? It's because it's not in your nature. Mm -hmm. mm. Also, because we just think if someone's being nice to us... They're probably they like nice. Yeah. 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 And so I think taking things on face value all the time is part of why we could be vulnerable. It's like that if someone is saying to me, I like you and it's going to be okay, I am going to believe them, really. And even if someone told me you shouldn't trust that person, I would still probably believe them. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the way that I interpret people's communication is based so much on the specific language and the words that they are saying to me and isn't taking so strongly into account their body language or their gestures or their tone of voice or their eye, particularly the way they use their eyes. And a lot of lies are actually spotted by those more subtle, nuanced things rather than the words they're using. Whereas I am really like listening to the words you're saying as my predominant source of understanding who you are and what your intentions are. And that is a vulnerability, isn't it? If you found this video helpful, please like, consider subscribing to the channel and check out the description box for more information.